so we have two of those fabulous speakers here in the audience, Patty Healy and John Musso, both Cumberland advisors, and you can uh, read their fantastic bios. Um, and then we have a third person who is um, potential, oh, there's stairs on the other side. And we have another person who is hopefully going to join us by Zoom. Hey there! Hey, Perch! Where's the camera? Hey. <laughs> we're glad you're here. For having me. <laughs> yes, we're glad you're here. Um, would you, uh, do you mind, do you want to go first or second or third? <laughs> I'm open to whatever is best for you guys. Well, I would like you to go first because I have a sneaky suspicion that, oh, there's the camera. Um, I was the, this is the first time I've ever done this. Um, <laughs> I have a sneaky suspicion, and I'm not making any comment on our facilities, but I think while we've got you on Zoom and there's no hurt, no rain or weather or problem, maybe you can give us your uh, few moments of thoughts on ESG investing and what it means to you and your organization first. And then we'll go to um, Patty and John. Uh, sure, so, so just as a brief introduction, um, I'm Chris Toll, I'm the founder of Life and Liberty Indexes. We do freedom-weighted emerging markets equity. So we have an ETF, uh, the ticker is FRDM, and it is freedom-weighting in the emerging markets. So for us, ESG, it just means not funding dictators with your emerging markets allocation. As everyone here probably knows, uh, benchmarks in the emerging markets are very heavily allocated and concentrated in uh, autocracy risk. So when Russia happened earlier this year, um, I think a lot of us woke up to that, but the bigger risk is actually is China. And, uh, and there's also Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Turkey, Qatar, UAE, there's just a lot of autocracies in the emerging markets uh, benchmarks and indexes and funds. So what we do is we uh, freedom weight the emerging markets instead of market cap weight them. So that gives us a, um, a, an allocation that is a much freer country set. So instead of you know China, Russia, Saudi Arabia, we have Taiwan, Chile, Poland, and so forth. So, uh, so it's, a, it's a kind of a freer way to invest in emerging markets where you can benefit from the um, the higher freedom countries, which we believe will outperform in the future. So that's our approach to uh, kind of ESG in uh, the emerging market space. It's not security level ESG metrics that we're all used to seeing in the industry, uh, but we're kind of using new metrics. And, and I do get my uh, metrics from third party think tanks. Terrific, thank you, thank you, Park. Um, and before we go to questions, we'll, next go, is that okay? Uh, okay. <laughs> So um, I thought it was going to be a Q and A. Kind it will of be a Q and A, Q &A. but just tell a little bit about what you do at okay. Cumberland and how that works yeah. in so, the credit space. I'm the senior vice president of research or credit research at Cumberland Advisors. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> I'm the senior vice president of research at Cumberland Advisors and credit research particularly. And Cumberland Advisors is an investment management firm. And the majority of our investments are in fixed income. Of that, the uh, majority of those fixed income investments are in municipal bonds. Even in our taxable strategies, we invest in taxable municipal bonds. So my history starts back with the rating agencies, so I've been looking at municipal bonds for a very long period of time. Uh, maybe I'll just go through what's going to be my first slide. Uh, when I started looking at investments, you looked at the legal security, the financial viability of the organization, the system that they were financing. Uh, you looked at the service area of the economy, um, the economy of the service area or the client base, as well as management or governance. So that's kind of the framework that it was always in. And you were always, especially when you were looking at governance, you were looking at, is management looking at all the risks that they need to, to be sustainable, which was not a word used back then, but that's kind of what it was. So you fast forward to maybe 2015 or, well before that, uh, there were a lot of people trying to engage companies and investors in being more environmentally, social, and governance 
related especially with climate, as we all know, that's what we've been talking about today. Uh, and then in Europe, you know, with the development of the UN Social Development Goals, uh, that we've been talking about as well today, uh, that kind of made a push in that direction. It caused some regulations. It caused um, a lot of activist engagers that would say, you know, try to engage companies and engage investors to then look at things through an ESG lens and have them, you know, really, really take the charge uh, to, to get things to happen. And that has happened a, a lot. <laughs> so, um, just hang on a second. So, okay, so with that, it was kind of like a kind of narrowish lens in a sense, and this has also been talked about today, but it evolved into, hey, we weren't looking at the social risks of getting away from climate. We weren't looking at the health risks. We weren't looking at the electric grid reliability. We weren't looking at the war risks. And so, you know, the things that have happened recently, all those things have made, made us, uh, well, the world's not as secure, and some social risks were, were totally left out, and reliability, to become social because people are freezing or they're dying of heat exhaustion or what have you. So I find that maybe it's just the way humans are. <laughs> you know, you go from, you try and take care of one problem and it creates these other problems. Like this, like that. So, uh, <coughs> uh, sorry about this. Okay, so um, maybe I'll stop there and then, oh, well, let me go right into this. So, so now there's been politicization or, of everything, and a couple of the examples that have been talked about are, you know, the state of Texas said it would not do business with um, organizations that wouldn't do business with gun companies or energy companies. So that was one of the like, you have to do it this way. And then the state of Texas said, well, you know what? We're not gonna, we're not gonna have our pension funds invest in in you, and we're not gonna do any business. With your, these companies, so some banks said, uh, that said they're not doing guns and energy are now losing deals in Texas, especially on the public finance side, where um, like UBS is the most recent one just got knocked out of an underwriting team because they're perceived, and UBS especially, Swiss companies very active in the ESG space, so uh, they got knocked out of the deal. You make such a you make such a good point, Patty. That there's two sides to some of these social things. It reminds me. It reminds me of an event. I was um, I have a particular denomination that uh, religious denomination, Christian religious denomination that is uh, worldwide, and one of their conferences, or um, may uh, to be thought of as a district or what have you, had decided not to have armaments. So they had always in the church had you know no gambling no pornography and no usury, things like this. And then one section said no armaments. And shortly after that, I had an opportunity to present in Texas. And I said, so how do y'all feel about this no armaments thing? <laughs> and the whole board made up of mostly men in cowboy hats said, well, we all have guns on us right now, so that's not gonna be in our investment policy statement. So there, so there are, you know, two, multiple sides to social and the easier one as constance kind of indicated is the the government's governance part and i'm sure that 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 has changed a lot john do you want to uh jump in real sure. quick and then we'll come back to perth and patty yeah just working yeah um you know at cumberland i'm the ceo uh, but i also manage the bond area which is really the toy box part of the job so um, and, and this year has been as challenging as any other year probably in, in my career. But when we think about municipal bonds, which is most of what the firm manages from a bond standpoint, you think about municipal bonds were the original ESG investment to start with, right? You think about things like public transportation or back when you had pollution control revenue bonds, et cetera. These were these were public goods and performing really necessary tasks, and there was no designation of whether they were ESG or not. 
and the MTA in New York's been issuing bonds for a long, 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 long time uh, in the tax exempt area. So as you meet the vanguard of into, into ESG with the municipal bond space, um, some of the stuff is, is already happening. And I would suggest that, and, and it was interesting because I, I personally think the biggest uh, ramification for ESG and municipals going forward uh, will be in the climate area. And having just gone through Hurricane Ian, uh, you can see that evolving. And in Dave Offick's chart this morning, we saw that the dark area in the southeast, which included all the way from Texas to Florida and the Carolinas, and, and when we heard um, when we heard Bob Bunting, that's the area that's going to be spending a hell of a lot more on climates, and you'll see bonds issued for ESG in the climate area. Think about a place like Miami, where uh, South Beach floods regularly and is underwater. You will see public finance efforts for uh, filtration systems and levees, etc., and it will basically be taking on the same kind of mechanics that Venezuela has had. And, that's going to evolve over the next 20 or 30 years. And does it come at a cost? You bet. And, and, and not the cost of ESG, just the, the investing in that kind of public finance process. So how, how do they classify it? Uh, you know, we are less than a month away from the congressional election. And I would suggest that itself will present um, not really an opportunity, but, but you know, could, could set the stage for some good some, some battles over ESG. Because we know we have the red state, blue state effect. And if you, uh, if you look at someone like Texas who believes that it's gone too far and fights back against what they see as an ESG designation or basically the standards for an ESG, that's a lot different than from a, a state of Washington or a state of Maine or, or other places. And the mix of Congress, you know, depending on what goes on, uh, will change. And of course, the, the right things that the left is, is, is pushing their policies without the benefit of having been elected. And the left thinks that the uh, right is ignoring uh, basic science, as we saw from, from you know, Bob today, whether, whether it's on climate, but on other things as well. Uh, so we think that has a lot of this to play out. At Cumberland, what we've been evolving towards is, is not so much developing an ESG style, which I guess if we had 10 years ago would have been okay, because there's so many people in it right now. The swimming pool is full of ESG ETFs, EFT, uh, ESG bond funds, etc. Uh, what I think we're more interested at Cumberland is developing the ability to tell clients, here's what you have and how it's designated as, as ESG. And more from an informational standpoint and an educational standpoint, and then you get the feedback from that. And, and anything that engenders more client feedback is always a really a good thing uh, you know, in our book. Um, you know, what goes on on the municipal bond side has really been a shortage of standards, right? In other words, what is the, what is the standard for a bond being labeled as an ESG bond, that's, that's on one side. And then the clarity on what has to be disclosed when you're looking at basically, not from the credit side of the rating agencies, but there's a further designation from them on it being an ESG bond. And that's where some of the, the feedback and flight comes from. You know, it's also, you know, spilling over into the bond insurance area as well. And you know, Assured Guarantee has just stepped up and they just started a group called, I think it's public, and they are basically going to be disclosing more and more of what's going on on the ESG side of bonds. So this is a, this is a train that is not stopping. It is, it is going forward. Um, the interesting part, and I don't have my slides up because I would just run through them real fast. Sure. Yeah. They're, they're past mine, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, this is a great idea, because I have a couple of comments. Okay, why don't you, why don't you comment, and then I'll go back to So, one other law going to talk about was the state of um, Texas, as well as Missouri, has, has basically started a probe 
of standard scores in a relationship to a, a U.S. report card on ESG related to state and local governance. And it would be so bad if you were, you know, like So, um, you know, if you look at the report card that they were talking about, there is no way, at least in my estimation, that S&P is saying anything political about E, S, or G. They are very clear that we look at environmental risk, we look at social risk, and we look at governance risk, and then we look at what, what wherewithal you have to overcome that, or what plans you have to overcome that. And then we moderate that number. So it's, it's, it's like I started out saying before, we used to look at credit analysis you know, through four or five different topic lines, now it's through an ESG lens. And that's kind of, I think, how we feel at Cumberland. We look at risks through an ESG lens. Um, and just to the comment that you made before, because the next slide is, so this is a slide from Moody's about over the past three years, the ratings um, that they have uh, done, both national, international, uh, private, and public sector. And you can see that each year from 2019 to 2021 too, the, the number of ESG-related ratings has gone up. You can see that, and the last panel talked about this, the social risk, especially because of COVID, became very, very prominent. And then the third point from the slide is that the role of G is growing over time. So it's a short time period, but it seems to be happening here. Quickly. And then to John's answer. Yeah, Jennifer. Yeah, I think that the um, the buy side is buying bonds. You know, it, it means different things to to different buy side people. But what they really want are disclosures, and and you know, and the issuers want clarity on disclosure um, and what's labeled. This does come at a cost, though, and I'll run through this quickly. You basically can see that the return over time on an ESG index versus the S and P general bond index, so basically the green bond index, over time is negative. That's not necessarily a bad thing. And it's, it's negative over different time periods. Um, not by a lot, but by enough. And we know when you're talking about what has been until this year, fairly low interest rates, it doesn't take much of, a, of an interest rate differential to make a difference in your returns. The point of it, from my perspective, and, and really as we move forward, isn't that you don't want to own ESG bonds, whether they're in a separately managed account or in an ETF, but do it with your eyes open and know that there may be a, a cost to do it. And listen, if you want to own a bond at, at a 510 that's backing a, a coal-fired facility somewhere, or you're willing to get 5% on a Massachusetts GO that's for a solar-powered office building, I think that's a pretty, for anybody that's conscious of the environment, that's a pretty easy throw for 10 basis points that you would take that. And by the way, one of the, one of the great things about investing in ESG bonds on the municipal bond side is that you're doing more work on the designation and the clarity of that designation, and you're not doing a lot of more work on the credit side. So if you have the state of Massachusetts is issuing a $500 million bond, dollar bond deal to build a complex of clean uh, solar powered state office buildings and putting their full faith and credit on it. It's no different than any other Massachusetts geo bond that you happen to have in the portfolio. So you're, you're really just making the same distinctions of our yield, maturity, call feature, et cetera. It's the same credit. Um, so, as you can see, different, even as you go out, they're, they're all there. So we can see here, over, over three years, and over two years, and over one year, they've all been outdone by the general index. Now, what does that mean? That means that, in, in the long run, people are probably paying up with lower yields to start with, 
which just gets reflected and we know that that compounds over time. And in a bad bond market, which we've been, that probably gets exaggerated. So, uh, like I said, there, there's probably an investment cost right now. That doesn't mean it stays this way all the time either. Because if just common sense would tell you that if you're going to get more and more ESG issuance, that may eventually have a, a, a give to the market, right? And, and some of it builds on itself. The market wants ESG issuance, therefore that spurs on more fund and ES, fund and ETF ESG products, which demands more disclosure, which demands higher costs, etc. So, you know, all that will eventually get reflected. I was just about to ask you that. Do you think that the spread narrows going forward between the different, I mean, because after all, we're all investors to make, make money. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's like anything else. If the spread gets too wide, it's, it's always about reversion to the mean. You know, you, you would, this would suggest that that would, that would narrow over time. As there's more demand for Correct. specific, and there's more um, disclosure. Do you, right. do, you, do you and Patty think that the there's the push for disclosure has had a big effect on the okay. price or quality? Oh, she's got a chart. Yeah, she's got a chart. presented by a series of um, 230 regulatory actions that have been taken by uh, nine U.S. federally related entities kind of all under the FSA, uh, you know, looking at risks from all different angles so that we don't have uh, something come up and bite us in the butt, <laughs> per se. And you can see, like, like Dave was talking this morning, that all those agencies have a, a thought to include uh, regulation and, and more climate disclosure. Uh, the SEC is, has the most done SEC regulates corporations. Uh, the SEC, the MSRB, which is the Municipal Security Rulemaking Board, is part of the SEC, and they cannot regulate state and local governments, but they can regulate the underwriters that work to bring bonds to market. Now, the MSRB, it looks like maybe they're, they're not, they're kind of making some progress, but Congress, uh, a bill was passed in the House and is in the Senate right now, which would require uh, municipalities to file financial statements in readable, searchable, uh, consistent format throughout the industry so that people can do machine reading and AI and, um, and come up with these all these statistics like they have for corporates. It's very, very easy to push a button with like Backset or Sustainless or whatever. <coughs> you push a button and you can know almost immediately what your ESG exposure is for various companies or even funds or indices. But for munis, uh, it's like the wild, wild west. There's different requirements. First of all, they only do annual financial statements, not quarterly. Uh, the information is not consistently applied. Uh, they um, so at any rate, and it would be expensive. The Government Finance Officers Association, which is the industry group for government finance officers, has said, you know, we really, really don't want this to be a requirement. It will be extremely expensive. Uh, some other market participants think that if this really, if this bill goes through and it's enforced and what have you, that a lot of smaller issuers, even larger issuers, would decide not to not to go through the music bond market, they'll go through the bank market, they'll go to private lending. So that's, and the new market is kind of shrinking a little bit as we speak. At any rate, so, so this chart I think goes to the disclosure that, that this was asking about. Um, I, I, I would add one thing. And that's also, you gotta remember the next generation. I, my, my kids are much more environmentally socially, and maybe to a lesser extent, governance conscious than I was growing up. And I have no doubt that will reflect in, basically reflect in their investing as you go to the next generation. So it'll, it'll become a lot more mainstream. But the other part, and I think it was brought out in, in 
Bob Bunting's chart today, charts, was about we are the asteroid. I think that is so true. And the fact is, is that if we're going to solve some of these problems, and again, I think, I think they regard to climate, both in emissions, et cetera, but, but also climate in regards to water levels, et cetera, is that you're going to see a tremendous amount of spending. I think you're going to see ESG become, whether it's designated or not, become a dominant part of the issues. So think, you know, you bring out about Texas being anti-ESG. But let's think about the things that have happened in Texas with the floods, the, the hurricanes which hit Houston a couple of years ago, and, you know, crushed a lot of people. And I saw it personally later on seeing friends. Or the freeze out of last year, which caused tremendous damage, still being fixed to the power infrastructure system. And when you look at the vast coastline of Texas, they're going to face the same issues as Florida. I mean, you know, go back and read, you know, the book Isaac Storm about the Galveston hurricane in 1908. Uh, they want to prevent that. And so whether they want to or not, they will be coming kicking and screaming to be ESG issuers because they're going to have to do that. And that's going to include that whole swath that we saw in Dave's chart in the, in the, in the Southeast. So I think, I think what you have happen is if you see these types of <laughs> instruments being issued, um, there's going to be enough of them. There may be a yield give in the market. And if there's a yield give, um, you'll see that performance relation that you'll see that flip over. It'll invert. Also for Texas, they're one of the majority of the renewables on the lot of renewable energy in Texas. So we've, we've talked a lot about climate. I was going to have PERT. Um, let's go back to the social part and governments. One of the things that you and I talked about before is um, kind of the question of uh, is Zero China, the new ESG, or the new S. Um, do you want to comment on autocracies and, and the, that governance aspect of the profitability of companies? Sure, I'll do that. Before I do that, though, I, I do want to say I have to defend the Texans here momentarily just because I'm coming to you. Yeah, I was about to say she's in Texas. And I, you know what? All of your stereotypes of Texans are absolutely correct. However, I go in with that mentality to a family office in San Antonio that got FRDM approved on Morgan Stanley's platform because they demanded it. Um, and I expected them to be very anti-ESG. You know, they made their money in, in oil. And I uh, was very surprised to hear the families, every generation of them, I was with generation two, but uh, this generation are all very pro-ESG and they're like, yeah, people tell us, you know, we should just invest for profit and then you know donate the money to causes and that's instead of doing ESG. But I was like, why not both? You know, so that that was their attitude. This very large family office who you know was was had enough uh, money with Morgan Stanley to get us you know on their platform on an exception basis um, is very pro ESG in San Antonio who made their money from oil. So. Uh, so yeah, the, the stereotypes are mostly correct, but you know there are always exceptions, even in Texas. So I just want to defend my fellow Texans here. Um, so okay, so go on, going on to the uh, autocracy risks. So ESG, that um, as we've been discussing uh, in the in the bond area and also just in, in equities, has mostly traditionally been done on the security level. Um, but in emerging markets, you know uh, that's diff more difficult to do because. You know, if you look at the, the emerging markets data, it's very unreliable because of the lack of free speech and free press and free expression. So without those things, you don't really have any kind of, um, uh, you know, free contradiction to government uh, or company data that comes out. And there's no third party kind of, um, uh, kind of independent, um, you know, uh, independent, authority on on this data. So the data becomes less useful to measure the impact of one's investments in ESG and other types of data as well. Um, 
So if you look at a, a country that doesn't have these freedoms, you know, and we, we look at you know, civil, political, and economic freedoms, a country without these freedoms you know, is very difficult to do ESG, but also it becomes a little meaningless. You look at the, the ESG products in the emerging market space, ESGE is the iShares Emerging Markets ESG, and that's the biggest one in the US. Uh, there's no alcohol, tobacco, gambling, but genocide is perfectly fine. So it becomes a little bit hypocritical, I think, in most people's view, and, and there is some pushback on that now. Uh, but also it's an investment risk. So, you know, expropriation risk. It's a huge risk in the unfree markets. And that has a huge impact on investment returns. I'm just going to share a slide here. If you look at, you know, uh, if you look at China as an example, China is always the uh, exhibit A for all of this. Can you guys see that? Yeah. Okay. So the expropriation risk in China, this is the MSCI China Total Return Index in the green down here. Uh, this is the, the onshore and offshore shares since 1992, which is the inception of this index. And then in the black line, you see China's GDP. We're not gonna see this going forward, obviously, but this has been a very steady growth and very real growth because China rolled back their Mao era um, kind of policies and went to better economic policies that led to this growth. But um, investors have not really taken part in that. And that's because of the lack of transparency and ownership, lack of transparency in their books and their accounting. A lot of the, the returns get expropriated to who the government actors are. And so investors in a time of extreme growth did not participate at all, basically. This is abysmal, this is worse than treasuries. So um, that's the risk of investing in autocracies where you don't have any kind of accountability on both data and where you know, returns go. Um, that, that's a, let me just go to a different slide here. In addition, you know, there's all kinds of beneficial outcomes if we're talking about ESG uh, to freer markets and freer you know, countries. And so, you see that there's higher income per capita in the freer countries. There's higher income share in the poorest 10%. So the poorest people are, are uh, richer in the, um, in the freer countries. There's lower poverty. There's higher life expectancy. There's higher gender equality. And there's lower infant mortality. And you see all these here. And this is from data from our data providers at the Cato and Fraser Institutes. And so, you know, all of these are very ESG type of outcomes that I think ESG investors want, uh, but it's very hard to measure. So you know what we try to do with freedom weighting is kind of be a running scorecard for for freedom in the emerging market equity space. Um, so so yeah, those are kind of some of the things that we consider when we look at the S, but also the G, um, kind of on the country level. And we don't look at the E specifically in, as part of the metrics, but. We have found a very high correlation between freedom and uh, better environmental protections. So, um, so that kind of does take care of itself. But yeah, what we do is we just look at the country level, and that's how we address some of these autocracy risks. Thank you, Mark. Um, John, Patty, do you have things you want to add? I was just going to say uh, quickly, I listened to a uh, equity presentation of I think it was David Morgan on data service providers, industry providers, rating agencies, Bloomberg, and the amount of money that these firms are expected to make over the next few years providing all this data is pretty pretty extreme. So it's a, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a direction that people are going, it seems like people want it. And I guess it's also a good investment. I was about to say, maybe we should be investing in data and those <laughs> analytics for us. And if you wonder why our Moody subscription is going it's up. It's going up and up, right? <laughs> it's kind of interesting. And so, um, so just to uh, go to my last slide. Um, and there really is more and more data. I mean, just, every, I mean, couldn't so... I remember when, um, I remember back when the internet was new, um, and people talked about, oh, there's so much knowledge out there, and I corrected people and said, it's not knowledge, it's just data. And data plus experience equals knowledge. 
Um, so I'm right. sure we were talking about the disclosure before too. I did want to say that it is better for investors to have more disclosure, to have some more disclosure, and to be part of it. But I also think that going back to the regulation slides, if you have too much regulation, it eliminates some thoughts sometimes and gets too much bureaucracy. And there might be some other risks out there that we need to be aware of. <laughs> You know, just to not yeah. pigeonhole ourselves. I would, I would just add this. You would think with the amount of disclosure that's coming out on ESG, whether it happens to be with the money or whatever, is that down the road, it will lend itself to the benefit of, like say, a blockchain technology. And so I think at some point, a user will be able to get a lot of this information and not be paying the king's ransom to Bloomberg and everybody else. So, yeah, for the future. I think that's a little bit what Patty was saying earlier about how useful information is so hard to find. It used to be, you know, you, it's very different on corporate bonds. Right, and I also think that ESG does not have as much data extraction and AI in order to get that volume of their data. And then I think we need people that are kind of good programs to analyze that data. Okay, so you know we were talking about FEMA earlier. This is the state of New Jersey's FEMA map, and I, I mean, it seems a little simplistic now after all the stuff that we were talking about. But this is a free resource. You can go to FEMA's website and get their National Risk Index. Um, so you know, and, and I find that the people that I talk to that want to supply us with. Uh, data down to the zip code level actually have like an insurance company background because I think that was that's what they do and so they've branched out and there's so like I said there are so many different service providers and consolidations and things like that. So just to so Gloucester County which is where we are is the dirt or green one on the lower uh, west side. So very very low um, national risk index it takes into account expected annual loss social vulnerability, and community resilience. So there's a lot of stuff that we want to talk about. And this is just a simplistic one. I just thought it would be fun to show people in New Jersey what the risk is. I think it's, it's clear that with the red, the red uh, ocean country is like one of the highest risk points we saw that this year. Uh, the national average for the National Risk Index is 10.6. Gloucester is 7.24. New Jersey is 16.9, and Ocean County is 45 way up there. 45. Yeah. So like 90%, 98 percent of the country is lower risk. Lower risk, risk than Ocean County. County. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Good question. You would know. Oh, yes. And so I'm going to come up. Hey, Natalie. I'll come over and give you the mic. On that map, um, it looks like it's missing a lot of the areas that were flooded. So, so Natalie's question is, um, it wasn't just the coastal areas. Does this, uh, when you're talking about Superstorm Sandy, yeah. well, does this include everything? I think it because it includes um, resiliency. It's so below. No, 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 no. Well, I, um, I've, I've lived through a couple of storms myself, a couple of hurricanes. Um, one of the, one of which was Hugo in 1989 that went straight up I-77 inland to Charlotte, and so there, there's definitely other uh, risks beyond the actual coast. But Natalie, you have a question? Yeah. yeah. So I don't know if I'm jumping the gun on Q and A here. No, this is, so this is uh, maybe a bit provocative, but for Perth, um, you obviously look at political risk as part of this whole equation. And, you know, there are recently many situations where government has changed and gotten more authoritarian, uh, whether it's your vote or a sham vote or whatever. And, you know, I've been thinking a lot about this. Texas has come up a lot today. We have a decentralized governing structure, but uh, quite a number of states have come out with bans. I mean, certainly Texas banned business from Goldman Sachs, uh, Bank of America, and I don't remember the whole list, but um, from bidding on deals, there was a transaction that, uh, where there was a study of what the increased cost was on the, on the deal. I don't know if John remembers what it was, 
but there was a study that showed how much more it costs not to have the competitive bidding. And secondly, healthcare, women's healthcare decision making has been usurped by a lot of states and criminalized how obstetricians make their decisions and put them in a bind for potentially having criminal charges and going to jail as a result. So I'm just putting that out there to say, you know, are we thinking at all about political risk and governance uh, within our United States? Well, I would, I would agree with you. And I think just as a, a, if I was a citizen, I would be ticked off because it's costing me more money on this ad. It's a tax. It's a tax. It is a tax in the form of yield. Um, you know, so, so you, you have major players you're taking out of the game of competing for your for your bonds, which means whoever wins it is winning at a cheap price, and you know the investors win and the and the issuers lose, and you know that's that's the kind of thing. And that's by the way, you, you can flip that around. And a few years ago, there was a, a big controversy on the other side, and. When a bond deal come to market and there'd be a number of issue a number of underwriters, there's rules a certain number of firms. That's always been a part and parcel of the business. And you had to designate certain cases minority dealers, which could be, you know, not just racial, but women owned firms, etc. And there are a few people that stood up and say, I'm not gonna buy a deal where I mean, I'm being told what I have to designate to. And I couldn't have thought of anything worse if I was an investor, because I would want the person managing my money to be buying the best deal possible, and who the hell cares who you're designating, right? You know, and um, that's kind of the flip side of this. Yeah, when I was in the letter banking side, in a lot of RFPs, especially for like San Francisco, if you didn't have, um, you know, go have as opposed to marry, use teak wood if you <laughs> that these people that, that this is years and years ago. It's kind of funny how it's yeah, the world keeps changing, and and my my concern about some of some of this is that um, it does come in waves. You know what what was okay is now not okay. You know, and how do we how do we create metrics and boxes in a fluid situation? But Peter has a more important question. Not at all. Or more interesting. Just putting my lawyer's hat on and listening to the presentations from all three of you and some presentations early today, I, I want to ask this question. Do you feel your firms are at any greater legal risk because you offer ESG products, or do you feel under an obligation to give any specific disclaimers beyond normal disclaimers? Sort of like they've been represented to us as ESG, but we do not independently verify. I mean, there's there's a new characterization going on, and it's a rapid kind of characterization. Do you feel, as business people, that you need to distinguish yourself to protect against a higher risk, or what are your insurance your insurers telling you about that issue? That's that's a good question, Pete. It hasn't really come up because we're not. We don't have an ESG style. All we're trying to do is enhance our own internal um, information flow on bonds. So, you know, somebody may look at their account at some point and say, oh, I have this um, Connecticut uh, geo bond, and here I have this Connecticut geo bond that has an ESG designation to it. Um, we're, not, we're not doing a style, we're just private information. That thought has gone through my mind. Uh, I don't think we have any liability because we don't have a separate staff. I mean, if you decided, for instance, to benchmark to specific other ESG benchmarks, would you then, you're in, a different, then you're in a different category. Yeah. Right. But, but we haven't, there's no ESG benchmark because, like I said, we're not looking to do a performance versus it's just more, more information. I mean, the real question, the real question would be is if somebody looked and said, um, and they can look this up. Why? Why did you buy this ESG bond that's yielding me 20 basis points less? That would be a legitimate question, right? Yeah. Um, I, I've got one, two, three more questions. So please. 
Thank you. Um, my name is Lydia, and I'm the executive director of, of a small nonprofit in Delaware. And we have a school garden program where we teach students how to grow their own food through plant-based science. We work with over 44 with 44 schools, and there's 17,000 students in our program right now. Um, but our budget is very small; we're under 400,000. Um, so we've heard, of course, a lot about ESG today um, and the explosive growth that it's having on investments. But what we really haven't heard is how is this going to affect nonprofits who are actually doing the work that we on the ground to see the change that we all want to see in our um, culture and our corporate structures. Um, so my question is, how do you see this affecting us, and what advice do you have to make sure that we are staying uh, or a part of the wave that is coming or that is here, and not just struggling to doggy paddle to, to shore like the nonprofits you Great question. Advice for nonprofits. It's a great question. It is a great question. I'll, I'll take a quick stab. I think my colleagues here might be better qualified to answer it. But the world is coming to you, right? In other words, you are ahead of the game by fostering these goals. Um, boy, I, if I was a either provider of an ESG score or a rating agency, I would want to be in touch with nonprofits to find out what a what their concerns are. And B, um, what their what their what their standards are, because as I said, this is still a very murky area. So more information. Yeah, I can jump in on that, that um, guys. So um, so we our data comes from nonprofits, and it comes from like there's a hundred of them globally that in the Freedom Network um, that we meet with, and also we we on the other side. We work with nonprofits on projects. Like we had a defund dictators project. If you go to defunddictators.com, you'll see that is a tool that we made for the general public to use to see how much dictatorship exposure they have in their emerging markets, U.S. listed ETS. Um, and that's that's a, a project that we do with the Human Rights Foundation. And so I, we work very closely with the Human Rights Foundation, with Freedom House, with Cato and Fraser, and uh, about a hundred think tanks around the world. Uh, I would absolutely echo what John said is that you guys were ahead of the curve before you know we had ESG metrics that we're all supposed to pay for there were you guys and in fact because of the work of the nonprofits that we work with you know we don't have to pay for that other ESG data so uh, absolutely you guys you know I think to make the world go around there has to be somebody who's in it not just for money and that's hard to find on Wall Street so Thank God for the work of the nonprofits that, that we work with. Uh, and they're not, you know, completely nonprofit. They're, I mean, they're, they're designated nonprofit. But, you know, the people there, they're, they're making a difference. And, um, and so I, I absolutely appreciate that. Also, it's important for us to keep complete objectivity. In, you know, World Bank, for example, is, I guess, a nonprofit, governmental, non-governmental entity, but that, but that had, you know, a lot of conflicts of interest because of China and China paying them so that they influence their, you know, doing business scores. And we, we used to be able to use that score and now it's completely gone. The report is gone due to what they did with China uh, to influence the scores. And so I use think tanks that do not take any money from any government. So they don't take money even from the U.S. or Canadian governments. And these are U.S. and Canadian think tanks. So. So yeah, absolutely, it's uh, crucial, the work that you guys do. Um, and it's going to you know, make a difference whether you partner with someone like us who's a prof for profit, or whether you continue to do your work um, on your end. Because um, for someone to, to you know, care about something more than money is, is usually you know, what instigates a lot of the changes uh, and the progress in our world. So, uh, Michael McNiven, Cumberland Advisors, I uh, have a quick comment and then a question for Perth. But my comment is related to the ESG conference. Uh, comes to mind the uh, thought that social philosophers said that uh, every cause starts as a movement, then it becomes a business, and then it becomes a racket. And, uh, you know, when it gets to ESG, it seems like we're beyond the movement. And we're certainly in the business. And so uh, just as a question, maybe even just a rhetorical question, 
what keeps ESG from becoming a racket, right? So that's just my comment as a social philosopher. I have a question for Perk. Um, do you see... I think we're past the racket stage with ESG. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow, all right. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's a lot of skepticism on the, uh, on the uh, concept of ESG, and uh, that's been discussed throughout the conference today, Perk. And, you know, there is a skepticism about certain parts of it. Certainly, the social part has an open-ended thing that you know can be manipulated. But um, in all seriousness, I think that competition is what keeps that from becoming a racket. Because yeah. we have the ESGEs and the NUEMs of the world, but we also have FRDM, and then we're competing with those funds and saying, "Hey, you guys have some issues with your methodology," and then but we're providing an alternative for investors. So I think competition will weed out the, um, I guess, the less uh, effective sure. strategy. So I have a quick question for you, Perth, because I know time's short here. But um, you know, in investing, everyone knows about you know ten-year treasury being kind of like a riskless, you know, benchmark, so to speak, of the markets and things like that. When you start thinking about um, governance as it relates to autocracies and, and freedom and all of that. What's your benchmark? Is you know, is there a benchmark, or what's the ideal? And then my uh, ancillary question is: Is freedom growing in the world, or is freedom in retreat? Yeah. So uh, I'll go last question first. So freedom, if you look at the course of history, is definitely advancing. You know, we are a lot more free as a as a world than we were like in medieval times or in the you know dark ages you know so it's so definitely in the long run it goes up it's like the stock market in the long run it goes up but in the in the short term there's ebbs and flows like like lisa mentioned just now uh, or actually maybe that's patricia but there's ebbs and flows in the short run and it goes back and forth like in chile for example as an emerging markets um, example we're expecting an ebb in the wrong direction and they just had an election where we were proved wrong, and it went pro, you know, freedom. But then we do expect them to to revert to the South American meme uh, in coming years because of their new government that they elected. Now, that's it's, there's always a wait. Uh, Okay, so Perth is super smart and super interesting, and we have her contact information if you all want to ask her any more questions. Can I just ask Can we just time out on her? Yes, John. Just, just to answer, I, would, I would say I think freedom continues to expand in the world. You know, you didn't see this as much during COVID, but we know, we know in cities well beyond Hong Kong, there's lots of fomenting going on for freedoms that people want. And regardless of whether Xi is elected for a third term or not, I think in 25 years China's going to look a hell of a lot different. And it's going to look different because more people are going to have more people, not just Chinese. I like the idea of ending this on the thought that there will be more freedom. And freedom is, I mean, I like, I like that positive thing. Thank you very much. We are at time. So um, I believe we have a break for a few minutes. Thank you. Please, thank you all.